I'm Steve Dean, I'm from The Ohio State University, and I'll be talking on the physical examination in uh, lipedema. Uh, disclosure not really relevant, we're not going to be talking about any, um, any treatment per se. So here's our outline. We're going to talk about very well recognized clinical manifestations of lipedema, then uh, we'll review some of the less recognized clinical manifestations of lipedema, and finally we'll culminate in a discussion on various hybrid forms of swelling that involve lipedema. lipedema. So let's start off with the well recognized clinical manifestations of lipedema. So all the way back in 1951, Doctors Wold, uh, Allen, and Hines released this seminal article on lipedema, or lipedema. Lipedema of the legs, a syndrome characterized by fat legs and edema. And they recognized six clinical manifestations, cardinal manifestations of lipedema that have clearly stood the test of time. And they are as follows. Number one, almost exclusively female. Number two, the swelling is bilateral and symmetrical with sparing of the foot. Uh, an element of minimal pitting orthostatic or dependent edema at the end of the day that typically occurs around the ankles and the bottom part of the calves. Pain. Dr. Herbst has shown 90% of patients with lipedema have significant pain. Tenderness as well. Easy bruising. And finally, persistent enlargement of the extremities after elevation or even weight loss, which leads to the adage, you can't starve lipedema. So unfortunately, lipedema is frequently misdiagnosed as lymphedema. But let's compare and contrast these two entities and see where you shouldn't misdiagnose these two causes of limb swelling. Because of two cardinal reasons. Number one, on the left, lymphedema. Swelling typically, although not invariably, involves the dorsum of the foot. Whereas in lipedema, swelling typically, but not invariably, does not involve the foot. They're sparing of the foot. And then finally, as we referenced on the last slide, lipedema is a bilaterally symmetrical process, whereas lymphedema, even in your bilateral primary lymphedemas, which is what we see here on the left-hand side of the screen, there's still a symmetry to the swelling. Now, of course, this comes, calls into question Dr. Herb's talking about asymmetric buttock swelling. We'll have to see what happens in the future with that, but uh, regardless, bilateral symmetrical leg swelling. So now it's not just symmetrical lower extremity swelling, it's disproportionate symmetrical lower extremity swelling as seen here in this patient of mine. I mean, look at that small waist. And this leads to sparing of the trunk, which we'll talk as or refer to as the truncal lower extremity mismatch. And this particular configuration has been described as the configuration of a pear, a pear-shaped body, if you will. So again, a truncal lower extremity mismatch, which is quite evident on this patient. What do you notice also on this patient's abdominal wall? You see that scar there? Guess what she had? Gastric bypass surgery. You just need to lose weight. She lost weight all right in her trunk, but her lower extremities never improved. She can't starve lipedema. And it's interesting, when you get used to seeing this particular configuration, even before you have the patient undressed, as seen here in the table, you can just, you can pick up that particular configuration, the truncal lower extremity mismatch, even before they undress. A uh, very characteristic finding of lipedema, the ankle cutoff or cuff sign, where the swelling abruptly terminates at the level of the ankles. Uh, there's, a, there's a mild case, there's a more severe case. It looks more like an ankle cuff or a cuff of a pants, if you will. I even saw this referred to as a, an ankle bracelet sign uh, in a recent uh, article. So the ankle cutoff or cuff sign. So what is characteristic of lipedema that you see here? Well, it was already referenced in those six cardinal features, a tendency to easy bruising or spontaneous hematomas. And this probably reflects this underlying microangiopathy of lipedema with associated capillary and venous fragility. Showing you the ankle cutoff sign there as well. So what is characteristic of lipedema on this particular slide? Right there, this fatty protuberance known as the lateral malleolar fat pad sign, or this collection of fat along the outside of the ankle. 
Uh, I find this very helpful in patients that you see with very mild swelling, some stage ones, you're not sure, do they really have lipedema? And if you look at their, the outside of the ankle, you'll see that protuberance of fat, very characteristic. Sometimes it can occur on the, the inside of the ankle as well. Why it's more severe on the outside of the inside, I have no idea. But uh, regardless, it's a very uh, characteristic manifestation of lipedema. Now, I was glad to see this was referenced uh, yesterday by Dr. Eicher. Uh, and the only way you're going to pick this up is to look at the patient in a posterior fashion. What are we referring to? Notice around the Achilles tendon, you have filling, lipidimidus filling of the retromalleolar sulci or sulcus. So the Achilles tendon, normally you think about your Achilles tendon on the outside and the inside, you have concavity. This fills in with fat. So the only way you're going to see this is if you look at somebody from a uh, a posterior, or look at them from behind, posterior fashion. So filling the retromalleolar sulcus. Additional clinical manifestations of lipedema. Uh, due to the decreased elasticity in lipedema, you have increased skin laxity. As you can see here, look at those folds of skin. Uh, lipedema typically has a very rubbery consistency because this is a, a hypertrophic fat and it's non-pitting because it's fat. Although, like we referenced earlier, sometimes around the bottom portions of the calves, you can retain extra fluid in pit by the end of the day. And finally, the subcutaneous nodules, which have been talked about, a large, greater than a centimeter, consistent with your typical lipoma. And then in Dr. Erb's uh, latest uh, article, she showed that 100% of all lipedema patients had these small subcutaneous nodules. Now, I find it fascinating when you read the articles on these small subcutaneous nodules, all the descriptions out there for these. Now, we've heard beans in a bag. We heard that, and I heard rice and beans a couple of days ago. Uh, I saw beanie baby configure feel. <laughs> Uh, we heard pearls as well. Uh, in one of Dr. Earp's articles, she refers to these as spheroids, which is actually referenced in the, in the last talk, uh, spheroids. And, uh, and finally, I think they feel like BBs. And in fact, in one of Dr. Earp's articles, she referred to these as buckshot type nodules. So whatever, it, who knows what the, the next uh, description is going to be. I, I can't keep up with them all. Just another example of showing the tremendous skin laxity with the mattressing phenomenon along the outside of the thighs. So what do we see here characteristic of lipedema? In fact, in about 50% of patients with lipedema, you see the following physical finding. Spider and varicose veins. A little bit better example there for you to see because they're subtle on the, the one on the right-hand side. Uh, now, it's interesting, it, the significant incompetence or reflux of the superficial and deep venous system is typically absent in lipedema. It can occur, but even if it occurs, I'm not convinced that's playing a big role in their swelling. Uh, again, it probably reflects some type of widespread vasculopathy these patients have. What am I showing here? Another example, a classic example of the ankle cutoff sign. So let's look at some less recognized clinical manifestations of lipedema. And I say less recognized, I mean this from a clinician standpoint. Uh, because everybody in here obviously is a, very, is a very astute audience. You recognize these manifestations, but I guarantee you 99.9% .9 of clinicians do not recognize these manifestations. You're lucky if they even recognize the common manifestations. So here's uh, the one here on the left-hand side of the screen was referenced by Dr. Wright yesterday. That is the genu valgum or knock need appearance due to joint laxity. And then also, as seen here on the right hand side of the screen, pes planus or flat feet. That was referenced in the last uh, good talk on the Ehlers Danlos syndrome. You see flat feet often in the setting of lipedema as well. Now, I'm not going to spend much time on this because this has already been gone over uh, ad nauseum. The lipedema has been uh, recently linked to joint laxity or hypermobility. We talked about the Biden score. Uh, the only thing I'll say about this is it's, it's really interesting. I wasn't even aware of this until Dr. Earth released this data last year. And I don't know about any of the clinicians in here, but the first time I started examining patients and, and having, trying to have them oppose their thumb to their forearm, they looked at me like I had lost my mind. I mean, I'm here to see this clinician for leg swelling and he's trying to push my thumb back to the forearm. So now I always preference my exam with, well, lipedema has been linked to increased joint laxity and therefore I'm going to examine your, uh, your hands. 
So fatty lobules, uh, these are interesting, right around the inside of the knee, uh, above or beyond or above or below the inside of the knee, start to get this little fattery protuberance there. Now with time, it can evolve into something that looks like this, one of my stage three slash four patients. And then finally, in patients that have long-standing large fatty lobules, especially in the setting of morbid obesity, they can go on and develop massive localized lymphedema. So this is no longer a soft, pliable lobule. This becomes rock hard. You have skin findings, nodules on the skin. The skin becomes infected. Uh, and that's when you convert into what's referred to as massive localized lymphedema. Uh, obviously, the patient there on the far right does not have lipedema. That's actually uh, lymphedema that they have. And I'm just showing you, regardless, the MFL looks the same in a, in a lipedema patient. And uh, this is a very highly inflammatory mass of tissue. And it's interesting, actually, data from our institution last year published in one of the pathology journals showed that one in four of patients with these massive localized lymphedemas actually have abundant calcium deposition within their tissue and even heterotopic bone formation in some of these lobules. Amazing finding, which all reflects chronic inflammation. Now, this is a, a favorite feature of mine, being a vascular specialist, that the lipedema is frequently complicated by vasospastic disease, specifically cutaneous hypothermia. The skin is unusually cold, especially in the lower legs and in the feet and the toes. And if you look at this patient there, and you can, hopefully you can make it out. There, there's just a, you look at the, the color of the back wall, which is sort of a cream curd, there's a little bit of a light purplish hue to that patient's legs. And it's amazing when you're seeing patients for leg swelling and you ask them, do you have cold feet or cold legs? And they look at you like, well, yeah, nobody's ever asked me before, but yes, I, I actually do. Often there's significant other will say the same thing. Oh, your feet are freezing. But again, you see this in the setting of lipedema. In addition, this is now a little bit more uh, evident as far as this discoloration. In fact, I would label this as some mild acrocyanosis. Notice the discoloration along the ends of the feet and the toes. You see that purplish discoloration? That's acrocyanosis in the setting of lipedema. Let me give you a close up there. Those are cold feet and toes. So what do you see here? Another vasospastic manifestation, and I can't give you the percentage that you see this. I know Dr. Erbs has referenced it that I definitely will see in the setting of lipedema. Let me give you a little hint. This poor woman obviously stumbled and ripped her jeans, but it's helpful in the sense that you can see the fishnet hose. And what we're looking at here is this fishnet-like discoloration, cold associated discoloration of the knees. Can you make out that fishnet-like discoloration? That's referred to as levito reticularis, and it's out there. You'll see that in lipedema patients. And then finally, I've seen two patients that have this disorder. You're typically going to see this in cold environments called uh, pernio or chilblains disease. And this is a cold mediated inflammatory disease where every winter patients develop uh, severe coldness of their toes. It almost looks like a frostbite injury. Uh, and I've, I've got two lipedema patients, no other risk factors, but lipedema for this. So I'm on the lookout for that as well. But again, it's a vasospastic disease. Why do these patients have vasospastic disease? I think it's probably linked to the underlying small fiber neuropathy. Remember that your nerves innervate the tone of the cutaneous blood vessels. So when the nerves are dysfunctional, the, the tone of the vessels, they inappropriately constrict, leading to these cold associated manifestations. The lymphedema phenotypes have been discussed, so I'm not going to say a whole lot about these. Let me just go over a couple of clinical examples. Type 3 is the most common. Uh, type 2, referred to as the jarred poor pants distribution, so really it's hips to knees, two very dramatic cases of, uh, of mine. And we'll, oh, go back here, look at that, look at those feet. I mean, again, you, you focus all your attention to the swollen legs and never look at the feet. Those are acrocyanotic feet. What am I showing here? Another example of gin valgus or knock knee deformity. Type three, the most common phenotype. Uh, you, I'm just showing you here. And this has been described that the, the swelling extends from the hips to the ankles, a pantaloon type appearance, if you will. 
Dr. Bartholomew was nice enough to give that uh, slide to me. Notice the truncal lower extremity mismatch, the upper extremities, or the upper extremities of the trunk not, not involved. Now, this is an interesting phenomenon, type four, the arms being involved. Almost every single article out there that you read will state as follows. One in three patients with lipedema have arm swelling. Well now, due to Dr. Erb's revolutionary data and one other investigator corroborated her data, now it's, they're saying that 80% of all these patients have arm swelling. But what I will say is now Dr. Erb's has also recognized that one in three patients with lipedema have fatty swelling on the dorsum of their hands. So that one in three is relevant for the hands and now I'm going to change this in the future to 80% have arm involvement. So this be your type three, type four phenotype. And 3% of these patients have uh, isolated uh, lipedema of the arms. I've never seen these. Still looking for an isolated case of upper extremity lipedema. What am I showing here? Filling of the retromalleolar sulci, that fatty deposition along the Achilles tendon. And then finally, type 5, cankles. Uh, that would just be the swelling from the knees to the ankles. I do not see many patients that just have type 5. They don't typically come to see the, the clinician. And finally, we'll, we'll culminate our discussion here on hybrid forms of lipedema. That is, lipedema can coexist with other forms of leg swelling. And I've got some unpublished data here that I hope to get out within the next year or so, looking at data from uh, hybrid causes of lipedema that uh, looking at um, our lymphedema database, we looked at approximately 1,700 charts and we ended up with about 463 that had lower extremity lymphedema. And we looked at all the reasons they came in for uh, manual lymphatic drainage at, at our institution. And you can see here, 55 of these patients, or 12%, actually had lipedema. Now, this is what's interesting. Only 11% had uncomplicated lipedema. The majority actually had lipedema in the setting of chronic venous insufficiency with secondary lymphedema, so-called phlebolymphedema. So lipedema plus phlebolymphedema was the dominant reason these patients were referred into our institution. Second most common reason was lipedema plus lymphedema coming in at about one in three of these cases. And then you can see here, there's nothing to say lipedema can't be complicated by a surgery. The most common surgery that led to secondary lymphedema outside of cancer was knee surgery, knee replacement arthroplasty. Bad news when it comes to the lymphatics. So let's get, uh, review some clinical manifestations of these hybrid forms of lipedema. So what do we have here? We got sweat, swing in the legs, pretty prominent ankle cutoff sign. There's our lateral malleolar fat pad sign but you also see swelling in the dorsum of the feet. So what is this? This is lipedema with secondary lymphedema, so-called lipolymphedema. Again, about one in three of our patients that were in the uh, uh, lymphedema center had this. Now, obviously, these hybrid forms are not more common than lipedema, it's just there's a referral bias. I mean, who's more likely to be referred in for aggressive manual lymphatic drainage? It's not gonna be your uncomplicated lipedema patient. So I'm in no way suggesting Lipophlebolymphedema is the most common thing you're going to see. It's just there's a referral bias for obvious reasons. Now here's a really good case. Again, a photo courtesy of Dr. John Bartholomew. Remarkable. So on first look, what would you say? Well, it looks like a bad case of stage 3 slash 4 lipedema, right? Because you don't really have foot swelling here, sparing of the feet. But it's where you've got to be a good clinician and you gotta palpate the legs. First of all, if you were to palpate these distal calves, they're rock hard. Are rock hard calves consistent with uncomplicated lipedema? And the answer is definitely no. And then upon second look, hopefully you observe all these, uh, this discoloration, this hyperkeratosis or excessive scaling of the legs. And then finally, especially on the insides, the lower portions of the calves, you see that sort of a orange peel appearance, which is referred to as a podia orange appearance. That's indicative of lymphedema, period. In fact, by the time you get to somebody that has fibrotic legs like that, there is definitely secondary lymphedema, even in the absence of foot swelling. So this is lipedema with foot sparing secondary lymphedema or foot sparing lipolymphedema. So what do we have here? Well, we have a patient who has a classic ankle cutoff sign. They have some mild swelling in the dorsum of their feet consistent with lymphedema. But how do you explain this discoloration in their legs? Is that lipedema pigment? No, it's stasis pigment. 
So this is a great example of lipedema with secondary phlebolymphedema. Again, one of two of the patients that referred to our institution came in with legs that look like this. Here's another example. So we have lipedema in a type 2 phenotype, right? Hips to knees, a jarred pore dis uh, distribution. Again, look at the discoloration in the calves. Is that consistent with lipedema? No, that's stasis hyperpigmentation. So another example of lipophlebolymphedema with this type 2 phenotype. Very interesting case. So again, it's out there. Not, there's really nothing published on this. You see a few references here and there to venous disease uh, in the setting of lipedema. Not much out there, but it's, this is a real entity. Just more examples of uh, lipophlebolymphedema, but there's something unique about the configuration of these legs. So we got our symmetrical, relatively symmetrical fatty swelling. You see the discoloration consistent with venous stasis in the bottom portions of the calves. You see the foot swelling consistent with lymphedema. But what about that peculiar configuration of the mid and the bottom portions of the calves? Looks like an upside down champagne bottle or an upside down bowling pin. And this reflects lipodermatosclerosis, which basically means lipo, obviously fat, derm, skin, sclerosis, hardness. Tremendous unabated inflammation has gone on for years. It's led to atrophy of the bottom portions of the calves. So a great example of lipophlebolymphedema with associated chronic lipodermatosclerosis. Incredible pictures. And we'll end on this photograph. What do we have here? I mean, again, I just think this is remarkable. I mean, you do not tell this poor woman to lose weight. I mean, look at that mismatch. She can't lose any more weight, but look at the, the size of her legs. You can see the profound stasis hyperpigmentation, the dorsal pedal swelling consists with lymphedema. You can see the lipidemitous changes throughout the, uh, the thighs. So we have lipophlebolymphedema. But what else is quite prominent on the left side of that leg? You have a little massive localized lymphedema as well. So that's it, I appreciate your attention.